All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for making it to the last session of the day. Hopefully, we will make it uh, interesting and informative. Um, let's go with the introduction. I am Ganesh Narajan, um, working for at and Integrated Cloud Design Team. I uh, have my colleagues, please. Hi, this is Manish Mahan. I work for at and Cloud in the development. Uh, my, my name is Trevor McCaslin, and I, I'm an upstream developer at at and Thank you. All right, so we, we got a power packed agenda today. Uh, you know, we wanted to start with why the need for speed to begin with, right? And then how are we going to achieve this with the help of technologies like SRIOV and DPDK? And you know, within at and uh, we have written a, a new service. It's called VFD, it stands for Virtual Function Daemon. We are going to talk about the architecture of that. And then we also wanted to give an end-to-end -end view of uh, how this whole orchestration can happen with the help of own app and OpenStack. And you know, followed by that, uh, my colleague is going to talk about uh, some of the internal details that needs to happen on the compute node. Uh, we also wanted to show a demo where we were able to achieve speed uh, you know, closer to the line speed. And uh, we'll also talk about some of the limitations and recovery. Followed by that, um, we will go with the implementation details. And finally, how we are working towards the community to kind of contribute to the uh, upstream community. All right. So the need for speed. I mean, we all have Wi-Fi routers at home, right? And you know, typically when the speed slows down, especially in my house, the first person to get impatient is my five-year-old kid. You know, he, he figured it out now to use that you know data plan, thereby giving me more bills. But imagine, you know, if this is about to happen in a house. How much of a speed and latency requirement is critical for you know, the business customers, right? So traditionally, the service providers built all their infrastructure with big monolithic black box devices, right? We call those as the physical network functions. And you know, if you are a customer premise and you wanted like a router, you know, we need to build a specific uh, router, put the vendor software in it, and ship all the way to the customer premise. So, Everybody knows it's all time consuming, it's very costly, it's not scalable, right? So thanks to the open source community, right? With the help of Linux Foundation, more importantly, OpenStack and OneApp, we were able to move from the domain 1.0 physical world to the domain 2.0 virtual world. We were able to virtualize all our physical network functions into virtual, fu virtual network functions, AKA uh, VNFs. So the real need for speed is for those VNFs, which are going to run on our cloud, which is, which is the at and integrated cloud. And we have transformed ourselves with the help of software-defined networking. And more importantly, we have built the infrastructure with the help of OpenStack. Now, if you see the, the requirements for VNF could be broadly categorized into the you know, following three areas, right? So you have the requirements coming over the network side. Um, you know, for example, they need high bandwidth, fast or high PPS, quality of service, service chaining, port mirroring, you name it, everything they needed today to achieve that. And if you talk about storage, uh, typically they need IOPS and uh, potentially some local attached storage with SSDs or SAS. Um, and if you talk about compute, right, so they need CPU pinning. You know, why CPU pinning? They wanted to avoid the context switching that would happen for all these VM processes from one core to the different core. And they wanted huge pages to avoid the number of page lookups, filling up the TLB cache aside buffers, and so forth. And then, and of course, they wanted NUMA, right? NUMA is non-numeric memory access. The whole idea is they wanted to access the memory, which is proximity to the core. They wanted to avoid the cross-boundary NUMA access, which incurs some overhead. And they might need some affinity uh, you know, to run a couple of virtual machines on the same host. And also, they need migration. Uh, it could be offline and as well as live migration. So to satisfy all these requirements, we had to extend the default flavors that is coming out of the OpenStack and define a much more informative and meaningful uh, flavor series for our customer needs. So we kind of identified the three categories here, which we call it as the network optimized flavor series. So, uh, you know, if you talk about NS, NS is network optimized SRIOB. So, anybody needs SRIOB, they could create something out of this flavor series. 
and then the second one is, is a network optimized DPDK, and then the third one is you know the regular plane kernel V router, or it could be like in some cases many would also use OBS. So these are the three different types of networks. Uh, typically, a VNF would need, and they could achieve it using this. All right. So in this slide, I'm just going to show you how the track packet traverses um, um, on each of these hosts for these three different types of network. On the left, what you see is the packet actually goes via the kernel uh, V router, or it could be an OVS, you know, before the packet is sent out of the network card. Now, with kernel, you get a lot of overage. You know, there is an interrupt happening at the host or the hypervisor um, when the packet needs to be uh, copied from kernel space to the user space. And then there is an interrupt going also at the VM level to read this packet. So with all these overheads, you know, you would be able to achieve only up to a speed of probably like one GBPS on a 10 GB, on a 10 gigi card, right? So definitely we can optimize this. So the second type is the DPDK V router. So we were able to run the entire V router or the OVS on the user space um, and uh, completely go away from the interrupt. And we are actually doing this, uh, you know, the pole mode, um, you know, drivers to pick up the packets. Uh, of course, the host interrupts are solved, but there would be still an interrupt on the VM side to kind of read the packets. And then on the third side is the SRIV, uh, which we are going to deep dive in the session, where the idea is. <clears throat> You take up a network card, and then you can uh, create multiple virtual functions out of that. Uh, and then you know you are directly attaching this VF device all the way to the virtual machine. So there is no interrupt, there is no overhead, and that's where we were able to achieve up to nine to closer to nine to ten uh, GBPS speed over a ten gigi card. And in fact, we are also going to show you a demo how we have achieved it. So in this slide, I wanted to show you how all these um, bare metal servers needs to be configured. If you actually see in this picture, all these three servers are all the same. It has got like 24 cores. You know, if you enable hyperthreading, it'll become 48. And then it has got you know three NICs. Each NIC has two ports. Why do all your switches? But the idea is on the left, you see it is an SRIOV host profile um, where you are. NIC 1 and NIC 3 is used for the workloads, SRIOV workloads, and the NIC 2 is used for your regular uh, you know, V-router. For example, you might need to attach an operation management interface for the VM for all your operation needs, and then the other interfaces could purely take the traffic. And then in the middle, you see it's a DPDK host profile, wherein NIC 1 and NIC 3 are bonded, um, and then the middle NIC could be used for your Pixie storage and other kind of uh, OAM traffic. And then on the right, you see it's a regular V router or OBS based where everything is running on the kernel. So you might ask, you know, why I'm really bothered to see this. The idea is it is important to define all these host profiles so that you could do the complete automation. We wanted to avoid any manual intervention. Once this has been defined, your automation framework could take that and deploy it in your data center. All right, so this is an interesting slide. The idea is. We are achieving SRIOV, in fact, with DPDK. So what does that mean? The idea here is you would need to virtualize all the physical NICs into virtual functions, and, and you, know, you can set up so many filters and parameters over it. The whole idea is we have written a completely new daemon. It is, uh, or you can say it a service. It's called virtual function daemon, which you'll see in the middle of this picture. That is actually a DPDK-based application, which is going to configure all these VFs to provide an SRIOV network. So um, we have a research team within at and who has developed it, and they also outsourced this project. Uh, I, I, you know, I encourage you all to go and check it in the GitHub. So what we can do with this VFD? There are a lot of things that you, you can configure on a virtual function. For example, you, know, you can set a quality of service. You can enable anti-spoofing checks over the VLANs and Macs. And See, this is a SRIOV. It's all layer two. It's all VLANs. So you should be able to set some VLAN filters. You should be able to support the Q and Q tags, strip the outer tag, insert an inner tag. Uh, you will be able to support all type of bump traffic, which is a broadcast, unicast, and multicast. So all these things are going to be achieved by this VFD. And just like any other OpenStack service, there should be a command line interface talking to this VFD service. Uh, in fact, if we see in today's Linux, you got IP link command that would talk to uh, configure your physical NICs. 
uh, but we are what we are talking here it's a dpdk based application so we created a new command line interface is called iplex uh, which is be able to go and talk to this vfd to configure all your parameters um, so this this is a high level architecture of vfd so what happens is typically all these parameters are sent from the heat template and those parameters are taken all the way to the noa compute right so the noa compute is going to um, put all these port configuration information in a config.json file and then it is going to invoke iplex so the iplex command is going to notify your vfd that hey there is a port that i need to configure please go and do it so vfd is going to pick up and step by on that config.json then it it uses dpdk apis to go and configure the virtual functions and send the feedback all the way to the ipx iplex and it goes the, all the way to the noa so if you really see we have leveraged an architecture which is very similar in open stack right so what happens when you create a, a virtual machine through noa you know the noa would go to spit out a libber.xml and is going to you know give it over to your kvm hypervisor to go and create the virtual machine that's exactly what's it happening you are actually spitting out the port information to the vfd and vfd would be able to go and configure it all right so i uh, so this is the slide i wanted to show you how everything fits together right um um like i said you know we are leveraging onap which stands for open network automation platform um there are a lot of you know it's a topic of its own and there are a lot of my atnd colleagues who have given some good presentation in this summit i encourage you all to go and read it uh, but i'm going to give you a quick introduction uh, or a summary of onap right so onap typically helps you for all this vnf orchestration it helps you to design the vnf for example let's take an example like you know if you wanted to run a vnat you need to know what type of flavor that you need to use what image you need to use how much interfaces that virtual machine needs to connect to and what are the vlan parameter settings that needs to be applied so all these needs to be done at the design level and the next step is orchestration so ona pass an orchestrator called ms4 which would you know send this information via heat template to the open stack region and then the third one is configuration it's not all about creating virtual machines now you need to go and configure the vm so there is an sdn global lot of controllers within one app that helps you to do that and of course we need to inventory all these vnfs you need to have a global view of you know how much of service is running in each different data centers there is a component called anai which stands for active and available available inventory that would do all the inventory things and finally uh there is dcae it stands for data collection and analytics so you would be able to look out for events in case of failures then you can go and recover and you know if you need to scale up enough that component will be able to help so in the middle so that is all this own app is running in the global centralized region and then that would be able to manage multiple open stack regions so in the middle what you see is what we call as a location control plane the idea is you have to run all your open stack services your nova neutron and everything and and then the the third setup is the your compute server so this is where actually the virtual machine is you know getting created um i hope you know this has been informative now i will hand over the next uh, session to cover uh, munish please go ahead thanks ganesh so uh, i'll walk you through the details how the implementation is so this is the first implementation and uh, this is our attempt to show you what are the advantages uh, that the nic card providers are providing by exposing the features now uh, some of the nic vendors are providing us uh, mailbox uh, on the nic cards and you have the switch on the nic card that you can program with these features so you can send the message to the pf by mailbox and then you can set those parameter on the nic and you can offload your nic filtering mac filtering your uh you can control your bump traffic you can say that you want to allow or not allow uh, multicast broadcast what all those things you can offload to the nic so you you have more cpu cycles for your processing uh, of the packets at the app level so uh, i'll uh, so, for, so for the setup uh, uh, of the compute So, so the implementation first you have to have on the compute the VFD daemon that Ganesh talked about. So to set it up, you need to enable the IMOU. You need to have in the BIOS uh, VTD uh, enabled. 
and you have to configure the huge pages. Uh, so in the VNF uh, world, we use one GB huge pages so that we can reduce the misses. And then you need DPDK driver, IGBUIO module uh, on, on the kernel so that you can talk to the NIC. And then you can also configure how many VFs uh, you need on, on the host. So, so th you, this, this will, like, you, your team can decide how many queues per VF you need and you know, tune this parameter. And then you can, uh, all you need in, in the end for the, uh, for the OpenStack is the PCI whitelist where you'll specify which uh, PCIs are mapped to which physical network. So physical network is the parameter that you currently use when you do provider networking. Right? You, you spe specify that field when you're creating the no one, uh, neutral network. So Ganesh walked you through the hardware part of it, NUMA and all that. So I'll take you to the implementation, how the uh, OpenStack will see it and how uh, OpenStack uh, yeah, the, it will be set up and how which part uh, ad administration ad administrator will do and which part uh, the tenant has to do. So, so as I said, the PCIs set up physical networks, uh, physical networks are defined, mapped to those PCIs. Then, <coughs> then you can, uh, the admin can go and define the provider networks using those FizNets. And uh, once the networks are there, uh, in the tenant space, the tenant can go and start creating the SRIOV ports. So, the, so it's the same concept where how you create the direct port today, uh, today in uh, OpenStack, but with some customization. So the customization, the key here, the change is we did is we input more fields into the binding profile of the Neutron port. I'll show you that. So, and once you have the ports, you can call the Nova API to instantiate your VNF. So when your VNF will instantiate with those Neutron ports, uh, Nova will call plug, right? Everybody knows plug who understand Nova. So it will call plug interface and that call will in invoke the IPLEX interface of VFD. So it will generate configuration file and also call IPLEX uh, to add this configuration to the NIC. So that's how the flow is. So going to the next slide. So we have modified not only Neutron and Nova, we have also exposed the, uh, all these parameters to heat so that uh, any kind of orchestrator can pick this heat temp definition and can orchestrate uh, the workloads. So we have the VLAN filters. So VLAN filters will be applied to the incoming traffic on the NIC. So so the filtering will be done on the NIC, and NIC, uh, the, the NIC will decide which VF to hand the packet based on which VLAN. And you can do anti-spoofing rule using, using the MAC filters right on the NIC. So then you can also do Q in Q, where you have advantage as a service provider. You can uh, strip the tag, the service tag, and then you can pass the customer VLANs, the whole trunk traffic, back to the VM and VM will process it. So then you have the bump traffic uh, 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 booleans that you can set based on what your VNF is looking for, whether it supports multicast, whether it doesn't support, whether you want to see it back to the VNF. So you, your VNF doesn't process all this. It's all done on the card. So that's the advantage right there. So then there are some more booleans. And so th this is the first attempt. So the NIC vendors, uh, any NIC vendors here? So NIC vendors know, right? Uh, the new features are coming in the new NICs. So this, this list is going to grow. So as we said, we, we, we can, uh, this, is f uh, this integration that we did is from the first version of the VFD. Uh, VFD is in active development. We, we have already enhanced it to do QoS. Uh, mirroring is under trial. That's another requirement for most of the telcos. So all that will be offloaded back to the NIC. So that's pretty impressive uh, for, the, uh, for all the services. Like you, you don't have to worry about uh, mirroring uh, overloads and all that on the 
system. So next slide. So this is the, my demo setup. I'll just, I have a recorded demo, uh, and I'll show you how we spin the VNAT, and we generated traffic from uh, one location, and uh, we connected, uh, we can assume the other location is a cloud provider or something, and the, this is how the traffic is. So this is a duplex traffic, both ways, bi-directional, and uh, I'll now switch to the uh, the recording. Uh, sorry about that glitch. So you okay. That and... <clears throat> Is it showing up? Yeah, full screen. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Okay, so I have a I have this VNF that I shown you. It has two SRIO V port. The rest of it is taken care of in another heat template where we had the cinder boot volume for this. And so this is where the customization is. So if you see on your screen, right, the binding profile field. I'll pause it here. So the binding profile for uh, this neutron port that I am spinning for this VNF, I have the VLAN filter. I can specify whether I want to uh, insert tag while exiting on the transmit traffic. I can specify I, whether I want to do spoof check. And this, this snapshot is after the VM is created, right? So I, I know which PCI is allocated to my uh, port and which FISNET I am mapped to. So it can give the operator a view on which uh, physical port this uh, this uh, the port is uh, for the VNF. So going a little further, uh, so once your uh, no, press play. No. Yep. Press play. So once your uh, uh, so the, this is the next port. So as you see, both the PCIs, right? One is from FISNET 1 and one is from FISNET 2. So inside the v, uh, VM, you can bond them for resiliency. So that's another requirement for the telcos. You, uh, so we, we are using, this is the VM definition. We are using, uh, we modified the, the NOVA definition of the VM. So this is the NOVA config, right, uh, for the VM. We, instead of interfaces, when you use DPDK drivers, you have to provide the host device. So now your VM is actually accessing that, uh, uh, that PCI address that's highlighted on the screen, right? So, so th this is how, like, this is the, these are the basic uh, changes that we need to do to achieve uh, this implementation. And uh, so on the, the we have this, uh, Iplex, uh, so this is the VFD running on the thing, and this is the Iplex. So this is the in interface that we call from Nova Plug when the VM is in in instantiated, and we call Iplex delete when the uh, instance is deleted. So th this, this integration is pretty easy and seamless, so you, you can, uh, you can even do updates when, when you want to uh, do the QoS. You can call Iplex update, and it will update the configuration on runtime to the card. So it's pretty easy. So and going a little further, uh, so I'll show you like the traffic. So the, as an operator, right, operator will be interested in knowing which how the traffic is doing, right? So, so this view will provide the operator the, the details of how the traffic is doing. In this picture, I have a couple of VNF spin. I have the traffic passing through. You can see the transmit, receive. If there are uh, spoof packets, you can see that too. And it, it, it's pretty uh, impressive, like you can, uh, make a judgment whether the the link is up or down. So it, you, you, the op, this is very useful for the operator. So we did some uh, performance uh, tests. 
during uh, our uh, demo recording. And we, w we were able to do close to line speed. I mean, this is a Ixia. It's sending the bi-directional traffic uh, on both, uh, uh, both the streams, one in and one out. So we were able to do close to line speed uh, using it. So, so that, uh, I think, concludes uh, this uh, demo. And I'll switch back to the uh, presentation. So, so the results are we, we are able to do line rates, high PP, uh, MPPS. You can, uh, it can handle uh, this, this profile that we are using for this traffic. Sorry, I just had this full screen. It okay. So, so the profile we, we used for this traffic is uh, IMIX. So we have uh, frames ranging from 64 bytes to 5,000 bytes. So then we, we are getting close to 9.7, which is like 9.9 .9 on the NIC, right? And uh, so, so let's talk about the limitations, right? So what are the limitations of this solution? So number one, uh, with the regular SRIOV, right, you, you don't have any, any security features with regular SRIOV. With this SRIOV, you at least can control the bump traffic you have all seen. You can control what's hitting your uh, VNF. You have the VLAN filters. You have the MAC filters, right? So, so this, this is uh, like better than the regular SRIV, right? So that's one. So talking about the live migration, that's, that's something that will evolve in the coming days. Like right now, uh, there are limitations in the livevert, and there are limitations uh, 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 that we cannot migrate something which has host device attached, right? So we will we are working with the vendors, and if we could, we'll take the snapshot of the memory, we'll take the snapshot of uh, the registers as it evolves, and we'll pass it to the to the destination host during the migration. That's, uh, that'll take some time. But uh, in the time being, we have ONAP. ONAP can detect, as Ganesh said, it's a closed loop. It, it has analytics. It, has, it is monitoring your VNFs. So you can build it really, uh, resiliency into your app design. Plus, you can also uh, like uh, respin your VM if the need be. So that's our recovery strategy for now. Uh, but we are gaining a lot uh, of performance with this. So there is always a trade-off in your first shot. So we are not there yet, but we'll be there. So that's our end thing. I'll pass on to Trevor next. So he'll take from here. OK, so I'm going to explain the implementation details of the demo that you just saw. So at the beginning of it, you're going to have to create a port with these API flags for the NIC. And that was put into the profile binding field. And then everything is, goes, goes pretty normal. Up in, uh, and the only thing that's different with uh, VFD is, is at, at step seven that you're going to have to generate the virtual machine configuration and add the host dev devices. And also, you, with the DBDK driver, you can include the PCI virtual functions as well. Uh, and then with the IPLEX, with that, gener uh, with that virtual machine uh, configuration, that will bind the port, and then that will also pass it to VFD to continue the rest of the operations. And so uh, when I was trying to upstream this to the community, this was my first, first uh, proposition. It doesn't look really pretty, because you just stuff a whole bunch of flags into the profile binding field. And I wanted to offer some other alternatives. So uh, I also proposed using the VIF details field. So I mean, there's not that much of improvement. So I was trying to think of other things. And when I came up with another uh, proposition, this kind of fits most, mostly with uh, like making like a hard-coded path for an uh, API. And then it, this will also make it easier to extend it for more features to come. So this is just kind of like what the database uh, API would look like. And then you can create the ID and associate it with a port using the synthetic fields that are already in place in Neutron. Uh, but then when I took this to the Neutron drivers meeting, they were, they were just saying, like, well, many of these already sound like they, they can be derived from existing APIs. And, um, and after some research, this kind of was true, but uh, not all of them exactly support SROV. 
So I started talk so I can map some of them and uh but the ones that weren't implemented were the broadcast, unicast, and multicast allow and being enforced through the security groups and the firewall. So uh when I came to propose another API, I want to make it more abstract so that way more community uh, members can and operators can use the feature to its fullest ability. So whenever the port's created, you could have uh, underlaying arch of a Linux bridge implementation or an OVS or an SROV and what it matter cuz each each one we delegate to its controller and enforce it with IP tables or OVS firewall or uh and then in our case would be the offloading on the NIC for the for the firewall. And so uh here's kind of like what that would look like if you're going to add that to the security groups it's just simply just adding those three fields to the bottom as like true or false and then you could use that to pass to the NIC. Um so this is already upstream VFD is a part of DPDK library and this is part of the dart documentation and their use cases that they describe so you can see here um you can have two different services running you have can have latency sensitive services running and also you can uh off use the DPDK application to offload your uh com computation intensive services and uh not all the DPDK flags are going to be required for this implementation we're only going to be uh pushing the ones that are coming from our customer requirements for our VNFs and so this is just a fast host based packet processing you can find this this documentation's rev relatively new it came out this year but it's on dbdk um and then here's another use case it's about inter vm communication um this this will allow you to do really fast uh communication between vms that are on the same host because the nic has a switch built into it that makes it capable and this this example just shows how what a uh, mac address lookup table would look like so if you like wanted to update the max you would have to go through this flow and the the steps are described there in the documentation. Um so coming on to future work, I'm already um have a few patches proposed for enhancing the Nova and Neutron capabilities. Uh right now there's actually no Q and Q network type in Neutron, so I have a patch for that and then also it's uh VLAN based, so I also refactored the VLAN to make that work nicely together. Um and then we're gonna have to add some kind of OS fifth object to pass these parameters and make a proper negotiation for the port binding between Nova and Neutron and then there's also whenever these NICs are released the the when the Nova is scheduling they're going to have to know what capabilities it has so there's there's a patch that's already been merged for uh, enabling SROV NIC offload feature uh, di discovery and then um based now after that you're going to have to integrate VFD with Neutron so now that Nova Neutron had can now the prerequisites have been met now we can start implementing the rest of a VFD so first of all you're going to have to test it somehow so we're going to have to support some SROV third party CI that with VFD installed and then uh we need to implement the IPlex interface in Neutron so it's like IP link but it has a little bit more extended capability so it'll look a lot like that class and um we're going to have to add options to the to the client i mean that that's pretty standard and adding and modifying database API models for VFD support which I've been showing through this presentation and there might be even more to come. And then whenever it comes down to the agent implementation you could come up with your own agent or you could also mod like you can make a agent extension of SROV or you could modify the existing SROV NIC agent to just use the new IPlex tool rather than uh IP link. So uh, and then also lastly just depending on where the API lands cuz I just discussed like how you would want to make it abstract and be across neutron there there might be more modifications needing to come so like if uh one of the changes were in the security groups you would have to modify the OVS agent and the firewall as well because uh SROV is designated for the no op driver um and that is all so uh, thank you all for listening for the presentation and if you have any questions can you please stand up to the microphone <laughs> and use that uh, i can answer the upstream questions and then uh Minish and Ganesh can answer everything else Hi, thank you for the presentation. So what I understood is the the things we show we we saw on the demo is a way of hacking, but the future wise integrating VFD with the neutron properly, right? With the agent. That's the, that's the holistic way to go, right? Yes. To make sure yes. we are not overloading Noah with the networking requirements, correct? Yes. Okay. The, that's the intent like we want to so for every implementation 
this is pretty new technology. You need to first prove yourself, right, in community, okay. showing them some work. And then now we are uh, working with the community, as Trevor already uh, submitted two, proposed two changes. Along with it, uh, I, Intel also submitted a new uh, change, wherein they are exposing the NIC features to the Nova scheduler. So Nova will know in future which NIC is capable of doing what. And based on that, your VM will land on particular node. So you may have some capability from some vendor have X capability and some has Y. So the Nova scheduler will handle where your, uh, what is your need and based on then where to send your uh, VM. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Can you go back to the side by side by side uh, early in Ganesh's slides. Just, yeah, escape out. There's a bit of messaging here, and part of the brilliance of uh, this one or this, which one? Uh, the, the simpler one. Uh, part of the brilliance that I hope folks can see here, that as you go, you know, from conference to conference, from meeting session to meeting session, there's a bit of messaging here about coexistence that gets lost as you you hear one person's experiences and another vendor's experiences and preferences. One of the brilliant things these guys have demonstrated here is coexistence using the exact same compute nodes, using the exact same software, coexistence of three different forms of networking, all using Neutron, with, of course, their additions that they're working on upstreaming. All of these options work for different workloads in production simultaneously. You don't just have to pick one type of network virtualization. All of these work in production in parallel same stuff, same OpenStack compute node. So uh, I applaud you guys for that. This messaging is very clear. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. you. Thank you, Jeff. So also a question about this slide, the um, uh, part on the right. So for the VNF perspective, what drivers do you need to take advantage of this uh, implementation? Is a salary V sufficient or you need DPDK or is DPDK hidden in the infrastructure from the VNF perspective? Yeah, I mean, you want to take that? So the VFD is built with its own static DPDK library. So the VNF doesn't need to be aware. But on the other side, the VNF also could be a DPDK-enabled application so that, you know, it could directly read from the VFs. So, so it doesn't matter whether your VNF support, uh, supports the IXGB VF uh, or uh, we hook it to the DPDK driver. We have VNFs that works both way, and we have certified those. So that, I think, addresses your question. So my question is, once you configure the number of VFs and allocate bandwidth to each VF, are you able to change it dynamically, or is that future work? No, we have more, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, I think we, ha we, we can saturate the line card with just very few VFs. Right. So, uh, but, but the advantage we are getting with uh, spinning more v uh, VFs is you can spread, right? Uh, you may not have uh, the peak all the time, so you, you can spread your workloads on the NIC, uh, on the host, and you can take advantage of more VF. So, so we know like it, there is a, like you can optimize based on the queues on the NIC, but. Uh, right I mean, right now it's a pretty much a static allocation. Right? You would okay. a percentage for all the VF, but I think that space could evolve more we, with more dynamic. We are, we are beginning to see a need for changing not it's not instantaneous it's not you know on a millisecond boundary but uh, let's say every few days you want to repurpose a running compute node for different vnfs you know move things around or spin up new vnfs so we are being, beginning to see the need for that sure yeah, so okay. if, would the vf agent that you are proposing uh, do that work we, we, it should be able to do it okay. i mean as long as you put the right parameters in it what to configure i think right. we can go this going okay. okay thanks I want to add, add to that last question you had. One thing that IPLEX gives you that in years past was a real pain, a real pain, was determining. It's like, well, I just put like a, you know, a, a vendor's virtual router or a vendor's firewall load balancer on a link and, you know, you're using SRIV, you're saturating that thing fast. Yeah. That, that table view of all the VFs state and all of those values is, is golden. It's, it's wonderful from an operations standpoint, because before you, you had to like scrape through all the individual VF outputs, 
compile them somewhere and that sort of thing. So having that visibility when you have a bunch of DPDK native VNFs, you know, routers, firewalls, that's, that's huge. And as I mentioned, like, uh, uh, VFD is very actively developed. And we we are working with multi-nic uh, support, so uh, you you can go to the GitHub link and yeah. In, fa in fact, there was a question uh, the other session about DPDK. How would we go and debug all these traffic, right? Can I use the ping and TCP dump? And of course, it's not going to work because those running on kernel. I think the idea is you can either run it inside as part of the VM. The other option is you can always do a port mirroring, right? And you could take it to the probes, and you know you can analyze your traffic. Um, I just want to add something here. If we have any upstream developers in the room, don't uh, feel free to join in on the effort and get in contact with me. Sure. Uh, the inter-VM um, traffic, does it work out of the box, or uh, you need to do something special? Uh, you need VEP for that, virtual Ethernet bridging on the switch. So, sorry, can you say that again? VEP. There's v VEB, mm -hmm. virtual Ethernet bridging. The, your up, uh, switch, uh, which the compute is connected to, should be VEB capable. Thank you. Just a question. Um, for projects that are coming up, like Project Calico, is there, are you guys working with that project as well to make sure everything works together, courier, all this stuff that's... Yeah, I think, about. right, Calico is for the container network interface, right? So we do have a plan to kind of, we are, right now all of our OpenStack services are, is running as virtual machines. Um, so we are planning to containerize all of our OpenStack services as, you know, in the Kubernetes pods. And then, you know, we are also thinking about Calico to leverage as our container network interface for all this communication. But uh, <clears throat> containers with SRIOV, I think, is a long way to go. Probably, you know, we can think about it for future. No, th there is a plugin effort going on for SRIOV plugin for uh, CNI. And also, <laughs> if you go to dpdk.org, uh, they already started uh, DPDK for containerized uh, loads. So th they are just starting. So it's at the, uh, like, just started. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, hi, I had two questions. Um, could you comment a little bit on uh, your approach towards resilience? Uh, and in particular, uh, have you contemplated uh, architectures where you have redundant NICs that are both capable of, you know, maintaining the same state information and processing, you know, without, you know, failure if something drops or breaks? Yeah, or that's an interesting question that you really brought to the table, right? So it's all about live migration capabilities with this IOV. Mm -hmm. You know, can we have like a Mac VTAP and, you know, those sorts of things that to go in. Uh, definitely we are considering that option, but right now our strategy is to at least seamlessly, you know, recreate or do an offline migration when we detect a failure, right? And a lot of issues that we need to solve before even talking about live migration. You know, in my yeah. slides I went over CPU pinning, I went over huge pages. The idea is, you know, if you enable huge pages, there are a lot of dirty pages going to handle. And we are talking about line card speed here. And taking that VM actively, to the, it's going to be a pain. So either the VNF itself has to be, you know, cloud native. You know, for example, some of our VNFs are running as primary backup. So we don't really have an option to do or address the live migration issue right now. But we are actively working to make sure that, you know, Munish also pointed some of the pointers like, you know, snapshotting the registry and other things. We are, we are also, you know, researching that space. Uh, to, to add to that, uh, it's, it's not only the com host responsibility for the resiliency. So we, we have a VNF that we are working with a vendor where uh, we have A and B side of the VNF, and these sides are, to, uh, are talking on another interface together. So we, we have the state on both. So if you add a route, you, you know that route on the other side. So if this host goes down, our service will be up. So, so, so in that's, essence, you're, you're pushing it up to the application level then? Yeah, so, so but, but uh, uh, as I said, if one side goes, I'll respin it because my service is not impacted by that. Yeah. So. Also, I think you mentioned that uh, you're actually pushing some of the VF functionality all the way down to the NIC. Uh, is that right? All, uh, sorry, sorry uh, your, uh, your VNF functions, you know, like, uh, so, so are you actually programming the NIC to do, like, certain, um, 
certain kinds of functions? Yes. So, so, so NIC exposes certain APIs, uh, the modern NICs. So we, we uh, program them to apply the filter and all those parameters I've shown you. So are you using something like P4, or how, I mean, how, how, how do you do that? We use but DPDK DPDK. APIs. APIs. We use okay. to directly manipulate the NICs, mm -hmm. but that would not really interfere in the traffic, right? The traffic, in, um, it's all between the uh, virtual function and directly to the uh, VNFs. So these DPDK libraries doesn't interfere in that. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Oh, last question. I, I have a question regarding the mirror interface that you mentioned briefly. I was wondering if that mirror interface is also implemented in the same way, utilizing VF and uh, virtual network yes. and DPDK. Yes, it has to be the VF and it has to be on the same physical network card because you know that's how you can you know do the port mirroring, right? So, all right. I think we are top of the hour. Thank you all for you know attending this session. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.